for centuries, basements were generally places to avoid. Dark, dingy, consumed by moisture, draped in cobwebs, and inhabited by unwanted creatures and rusting relics of the past. Well, a basement is really uh, a secondary space. It's often left uh, unwaterproofed, unheated to some degree, and it has all those associations of darkness and dampness and not being pleasant. As ever larger suburban homes take advantage of advanced construction techniques, the basement is becoming as lavish and livable as the rest of the home. The finished basement company in Denver, Colorado, is one of a growing number of builders specializing in the ultimate basement makeover. Uh, you can see this area is fairly busy. We've got some uh, high-end uh, theater equipment going in here. We've got a fireplace flue. We've got most of all our electrical and plumbing in this area. This area was uh, probably the most complicated area in the basement. I really had to be on top of this, meet with the subcontractors on a daily basis, make sure everything was falling into place uh, per plan and per code. The company employs 35 people and transforms more than 150 basements per year. It really has become a very individual expression of self, and so fulfilling of fantasies is really a portion of what we do. It's this experience of walking down, realizing, wow, this isn't a basement that I remember as a kid, and then having these surprises along the way that has people stop in the middle of the basement and go, wow, I can't believe this is a basement. Some 21st century basements are truly beyond belief. Sophisticated building techniques and some deep pockets will get you a basement fit for a king. Or in the case of this quaint Midwestern cottage, a basement roomy enough for the entire king's court. This majestic home sports an architectural feature that's all the rage. The walkout basement. The home is built on ground that slopes from the front yard to the backyard with the rear walls of the basement exposed to the world outside. In this case, this lower level was to be a major lifestyle part of the whole house. It was to be a destination that was going to be used very regularly and a favorite location to go to. It's the central core of the house it does have a dramatic access from the main floor down to the lower level, so there's a reception area essentially that then branches out to the different functions. The first function is highly prized eye candy for any large basement. A state-of-the-art home theater. The lavish room sports a 120-inch projection screen, double insulated sound dampening panels, and seating for 16 of the family's best friends. Like most projects, there's a lifestyle envisioned. You begin with all of the different functions that you'd like to have happen for your friends and your family. And whether there's game areas, there's uh, spaces for the kids, there's a dream or a vision for entertaining guests or, or groups of people. When the party gets going, this basement can deliver. With a fully stocked temperature controlled wine cellar and a full service bar with built-in saltwater aquarium. After a night of carousing, you can get back in shape in the custom home gym. Or take swings in the combined batting cage and golf driving range. Yeah, it was. But sometimes entertaining friends is a team sport. Never a problem thanks to this subterranean basketball and racquetball court. The court is over 2,000 square feet with a 20-foot ceiling. Eight 700-pound retractable wall segments fold to accommodate the racquetball court. Basements were traditionally hideaways for men, celebrating the rituals of all things male. But the rules have changed. The tumult of the new century has convinced many Americans that there's no place like home. And no place like the basement to seek refuge and recreation. Oh, we have red today. Mm -hmm. But the basement means different things to different people. A pleasure palace, a command center for home environmental control, and even a room to entrust with your life. The basement may very well be the most important room in the house. 
Just ask our ancestors from the dawn of prehistory, who conceived the basement simply as a way to escape the temperature extremes of their environment. Subterranean levels in houses are, are as old as we are. As, as a species, they, they go back to the beginning when we come out of the caves and the trees. When you go down three feet, the temperature levels off to 60 degrees, whatever the temperature is outside. It's stable below three feet. So it gives a good deal of protection from cold and warmth. In biblical times, homeowners dug deep to take advantage of another crucial feature, storage of perishable foods. Oils, fruits, and grains were regularly kept in subterranean chambers. These ancient pantries with their cool, stable temperatures were forebearers of the latter-day root cellar. But food wasn't the only item in the subterranean pantry. They also stored water. Large underground cisterns or storage wells captured and stored precious rainwater. While the ancients built these subterranean spaces for thousands of years, they were rarely beneath the home. The residential basement took longer to develop. In Greece and Rome, they were very sophisticated in their use of the basement. They used it uh, as a heating device and a cooling device. The origin of modern day climate control is evident in numerous Roman excavation sites. These basements contained heating elements called hypocausts. Hypocausts were wood-fired ovens or boilers tended constantly by servants. The hot air circulated throughout the basement, heating the floor, then traveled upward via wall flues into the home above. If you look at Ostia, a Roman city, it had mainly all the amenities we have today as far as heating and cooling and, and plumbing and all the rest of it indoor toilets and so on, and running water. They heated those with basement boilers. Some Roman basements were designed to beat the heat. Case in point, the fourth century AD settlement of Belarugia in the Tunisian desert. Here, wealthy homeowners constructed ornate subterranean chambers to take advantage of the Earth's natural cooling properties. Just a few feet below the desert floor, the Earth remains at a cooler temperature unaffected by the hot sun. Digging a basement home could reduce the temperature by more than 20 degrees. The Romans also looked to the basement to supply their entertainment. Beneath the arena floor of the Roman Colosseum, a basement level with large rooms and corridors housed gladiators, slaves, and the wild beasts favored in the Roman games. The basement's role as a locale for society's subservient classes was formalized in the 16th century by Italian architect Andrea Palladio. The style, which still bears his name, has become an architectural mainstay. A Palladian home was generally three floors, an upper mezzanine floor for private quarters, the piano nobile level, intended for entertaining guests, and the basement, or ground floor, containing the service quarters. The Palladium basement became a symbol for social standing. The idea of where one's place is in life was also defined by this architectural space. People were treated as base people, and you lived either underground or on the first floor in Renaissance times. And then the idea of the higher up you go in a piece of architecture, the closer you are to God. 18th century Palladian designers, including Thomas Jefferson, firmly established the basement in the New World. Jefferson's home in Virginia, Monticello, is a true Palladian estate. Basements also address the need to squeeze additional space into overcrowded urban areas like 19th century New York City. The poverty-stricken, crime-ridden neighborhood of Five Points was a notorious example of the urban basement as public health menace. Here, boarding house landlords were all too eager to rent out every square foot. The poorest tenants were relegated to the wet, foul-smelling basements. With a profound lack of ventilation and no way to prevent water seepage, these underground tenements were a breeding ground for disease. These people, when they came out into the daylight, had 
terrible pallid skin. They had just been living their whole time in these underground areas. By the 20th century, the alarming conditions in America's urban basements compelled health reformers to issue a call to arms. One of the major themes of the modern architectural movement which started in the 1900s was health. It was a socially based movement of architecture and they promoted sunshine and well-being and class. And so the basement became a target because it was no sunshine and in many cases wet and dark. As the 20th century progressed, better building techniques and modern materials would rescue the basement. By offering a cleaner, drier space, many builders would find home buyers eager for a basement workshop and extra storage space. From a hole in the ground to a subterranean oasis, building the basement would become a symphony of computer design, robotic layout, and some very large cake molds. Basements are often the hippest rooms in the 21st century dream house. But American basements got off to a rocky start. In the 1800s and early 1900s, the best material available to construct a basement wall was rough cut stone or brick, neither of which offered any waterproofing ability. By the 1930s, Preformed concrete block, coupled with better methods for drainage, offered some water resistance. To keep up with the post-World War II housing boom, block foundations became the standard. But many builders in the American South and West skipped the basement entirely. Their solution was the concrete slab, a foundation built directly on the ground. But in other parts of the country, Digging a basement came with the territory. If you take a look from a geographic standpoint, where basements have been built in America, they tend to be in the Midwest and Northeast portion of the country. And there's a, a bunch of different reasons for that. Number one is you have frost. And so you have, you know, through the winter, the, the frost will go down as low as, in some areas, uh, 36 inches. Establishing the foundation below this frost line helps ensure that the house won't shift and cause structural damage. Digging a basement foundation in colder climates means excavating up to four feet in order to reach dry and stable soil beneath the frost line. Digging an additional four or more feet will accommodate a full basement. Concrete footings are then poured into trenches along the perimeter. The footings support the basement walls and ultimately the weight of the entire home. Many regions have different requirements for basements. The footings are different, the soil different, and so requires different methods. So there are many different ways of doing a basement. One method is by which you dig out the footings, pour the footings, and then come back and pour the slab, which kind of makes it kind of a floating slab. And that's generally the way in most regions is done. Building today's basement foundation has evolved into a computer-controlled, moisture-resistant process. Often it begins with a computer-aided design, or CAD program, where designers establish coordinates for the footings and walls. From here, the foundation is ready for layout on the property. Today, the layout has gone robotic. An innovative system called the Total Station uses a servo motor, infrared sensors, and radio communication to measure the elevation and horizontal axes of a foundation site. It reads to the prism up here and shoots an infrared beam back and forth. With the time lapse between them, it knows how far away I am for the instrument from the speed it gets back and forth. That instrument's relayed through this radio and the radio inside the instrument. And all of that's also relayed through the data collector that tells me where to go and my cuts and fills. The total station fixes coordinates accurate to the hundredth of an inch. Once a foundation is excavated and the footings are in place, the basement walls begin their upward push. While some builders still use the tried and true method of stacking concrete blocks, most have embraced the cake mold method. Precisely spaced panels, or forms, 
create a mold for poured concrete. In a typical basement, you have a set of tall form and sometimes uh, what we call short forms. Typically nowadays, the tall forms are like nine foot tall. These aluminum forms are three foot wide and a lot like a Lego set, they assemble together and are set and locked together and it's a very efficient process. They stand them, if you will, edge to edge and, and assemble them right down on the footing and run down the wall and, uh, and create it a, a module at a time. Once the forms are set, the concrete is poured. An average of 50 cubic yards of concrete go into the basement walls of a 2,000 square foot home. Once the forms are removed, a perfectly flat finished wall appears. But there's still more to do to prevent a plague of cracks and leaking foundations. Rubberized asphalt house wraps and other new technologies hold the promise of the bone dry basement. The way this works is any runoff water that might come up against our basement wall will run down the waterproofing and then it will drain into these holes on the top of the pipe and drain out. Well, this is a basement insulation that runs from the sill plate all the way to the footer. It's a foil scrim craft over a fiberglass bat. And the perforated foil craft facing here controls the rate at which moisture moves to the wall, but still allows drying if moisture comes through the foundation. With such efficient technology, most basement foundations are routine jobs for the average home builder. But the occasional high dollar custom home is sometimes built on terrain better suited to a mountain goat. Each year, the Concrete Foundation Association honors builders with an award called the Basement of the Year. Because these award-winning basements generally contribute to high blood pressure, the builders fondly renamed the award the Basement from Hell. Above the plains of eastern Kansas, the 2002 Basement from Hell sits perched on a cliff of solid limestone. When ABI Corporation was asked to excavate a remote, multi-tiered foundation on solid rock, they knew the devil would have his due. On this particular site, we had just about everything to make this job difficult that was possible. 39-foot uh, elevation change, solid uh, rock, limestone, limited access, no place to put excavation spoils, a very deep foundation. We had limited reach for our cranes to, to get our equipment in. Excavating the basement required a 70-ton crane and two large backhoes, one to act as a movable rock hammer to break up the limestone, and the other to remove the debris. That process took about six weeks. It was very tedious. And as we, we stair-stepped this foundation in the side of this hill, and as we went up from one level of rock to the next, we could not go back down if we made a mistake. Inserting vertical footings and steel reinforcement at every step ensured that the foundation would not slip off the rock base as dirt was backfilled along the walls. Over the course of nine weeks, the basement from hell climbed the hill and eventually supported a home of complex beauty with a lower level that reinvents the traditional basement. It was hell for the, the foundation company to build it, but it's paradise to live in. What we wanted to do on the lower level here was to create one, a theater, a place for a pool table, liquor bar, and then there's a couple spare bedrooms down here as well. Uh, makes a real good entertaining home by using those kind of spaces as the rec room, but with the tall ceilings and all the light towards the south, it's the rec room that becomes livable instead of the dark, dingy basement. For many homeowners, a basement built to impress the neighbors is all that matters. But for homeowners inside the tornado belt, a basement may be the only thing between them and disaster. Over time, the modern basement has improved its image. From a dingy storeroom to a high-tech pleasure palace, Basements are now considered valuable real estate. But even as they've helped homeowners improve the quality of their lives, some have also helped to save them. By the end of World War II, 
and the beginning of the atomic age. Few Americans could foresee how close the threat of nuclear holocaust could get to their own living rooms. As the escalating Cold War took the superpowers near the brink, some Americans became convinced that steps had to be taken to ensure survival. In 1961, after the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Berlin Wall speech, President Kennedy addressed the nation in May of 61 and urged citizens to prepare for the unlikely event but the possibility of an attack on the United States by another nation and directed the Department of Defense to begin a survey of basements in large buildings throughout the United States that could be used as shelters in the event of an attack. While thousands of public fallout shelters were constructed in the basements of existing public buildings, many citizens wanted something closer to home. People sometimes put a, a shelter inside their basement. They would partition off a part of the basement and construct a fallout shelter uh, to the design criteria that the government had issued uh, as part of the 1960s effort to prepare the nation. For those willing to swallow the sales pitch, the basement was an antidote to Armageddon. Well, folks, I'm glad you could come down to see my fallout shelter. Just finished painting it last night. Looks like a nice job, Wall. You know, this shelter is a real good idea. If we should ever have a nuclear war, we could get a heavy fallout, even though we were not anywhere near the target area. They were mostly trying to protect themselves from the effect of gamma radiation. After a nuclear attack, there would be a large amount of nuclear dust. And as that dust settled on the ground, that gamma radiation would give off uh, life-threatening levels of high radiation for a period of about two weeks. Hey, isn't this nice? Well, Sir Ruth and I certainly can live in here very comfortably for at least two weeks. Although America's basement fallout shelters were never put to the real test, some did protect thousands from a natural threat no less frightening. The tornado belt is a large portion of the United States, extending from southern Texas into all areas of the Midwest. These freak storms defy description. When you talk to tornado victims, they talk about the fear of going through a tornado, and they talk about that when there are subsequent tornado watches or warnings, the uncontrollable fear that they have, that they have no place to seek refuge. But many have taken refuge from tornadoes in basements. Seeking shelter below ground offers some protection against these destructive storms. Basement safety took a quantum leap forward in 1970 in the aftermath of a catastrophe in Texas. On May 11, 1970, the strongest rated tornado event, a Force 5, struck the town of Lubbock, Texas. 20 people were killed, and the city was devastated. In the following days, the Civil Engineering Department at Texas Tech University in Lubbock practically invented the field of tornado impact science. We saw in the Lubbock Tornado laboratory that was made for us, we had some young faculty who were poised to do research and simply took cameras in hand and went out in the field and did an extensive documentation of that storm. The result is the Wind Engineering Research Center at Texas Tech. The facility is dedicated to teaching builders how to erect safer homes and buildings including the basement safety zone. At the heart of the center is the debris cannon, a high-powered simulator that fires missiles of common building materials at the velocity of flying debris in a Force 5 tornado. The debris cannon employs an air-pressurized 22-foot barrel to fire missiles as large as 2x6 boards, up to 200 miles per hour. When flung by an actual tornado, this common building material packs the penetrating force of an artillery shell. The key to any basement in Tornado Alley is to protect its occupants from these deadly projectiles. If the basement has a concrete roof on it that will withstand the debris impacts and not lift off in a storm, then it provides generally good protection. We still must have a door system on there because one would not want to be in a, even a basement 
if the door was blown off and debris could enter or uh, other things could enter. Cheaply constructed doors are common in rural areas of the tornado belt. The debris cannon demonstrates that many doors offer little or no protection from tornado-driven projectiles. But the thing we learn quickly is that there's a lot of energy in this missile traveling at that speed, and it requires a very hardened and tough section to withstand this. According to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, basements offer some protection, but not enough to stop falling debris if the home is ripped from the foundation. The only way to beat the odds is a separately constructed safe room shelter. Most shelters that are built in basements normally make use of existing walls, and to reduce the cost, you'd probably put the shelter in a corner so you could make use of two walls of the, of the basement. The key thing is that you would have to provide extra reinforcement. These basement safe rooms make thousands of Americans rest easier when a tornado warning goes out. But what happens to the millions of homeowners who don't have a basement? For them, FEMA and Texas Tech University have designed the first floor safe room, offering all the security of a basement without the trip downstairs. When you get above ground, you have to worry about the lateral loads from the wind and the missiles, as we call them, which is the airborne debris, striking the shelter, striking the wall, striking the door of the shelter that could punch through and damage the structure and injure people inside the shelter. To resist deadly debris and winds up to 200 miles per hour, these above ground shelters are built for physical abuse. Typically, they are built toward the center of the floor plan, creating a pantry or a walk-in closet on steroids. The door is the weakest link in a safe room. It's very important that the door has six points of connection to avoid having missiles penetrate the door. You have six points of connection here. You have three safe bolts on this end. You have three hinges on this end. Plus, the door is thickened steel so that the missiles won't puncture through it. If you don't have the six points of connection, the door can actually bend in and missiles can come in. The walls themselves, in this case, are insulated concrete form design. Those designs include reinforcing steel and then concrete support inside the blocks, and you wind up with a concrete reinforced wall. The ceiling's built the same way. Foam blocks are laid across the ceiling with reinforcing steel, and then concrete is poured over the top to avoid having the free-falling missiles puncture the ceiling. While first floor shelters will save lives, ultimately an approved safe room built in the basement offers the greatest possible protection. But protecting occupants from tornadoes isn't all that a basement can do. These underground spaces can now fight fires and sanitize the air that we breathe. Thank you. This basement in Kansas City, Missouri is designed to be the life of the party. It entertains, offers an escape from the world above, and keeps the family in good health. But for the average basement, the first sworn duty is keeping the rest of the home warm and toasty. In the early part of the 20th century, many homeowners gave up the wood-burning stove and switched to the coal-fired furnace. Each week, loads of raw coal were unloaded down a chute through a window and into the basement. At the turn of the century, that would be uh, shoveled in the morning and uh, the fire would be stoked and that would operate part, part way through the day. Probably stoke it about dinner time and then just before bed go down and shovel coal in again. Literally the furnace would heat the air and by gravity or buoyancy the air would move up through the house. And houses of that time didn't really have ductwork. Over the decades coal was replaced by other fossil fuels like oil and gas. The technology changed but the inefficiency and emissions of the gravity systems kept the basement a sooty, foul-smelling room. Gravity systems didn't even have ducts, they were just holes in the floors. We got a little bit more efficient, a little bit better at distributing air. We ended up going to sheet metal ducts like we see here. Take a peek into today's basements and you'll find a new wave of climate control. From electric furnaces and filters, 
to ventilators and even fire suppression systems. But some basements are taking climate control to a whole new level. In the Berkshire Mountains of western Massachusetts, a residence called the New American Castle is an ultra-modern rethinking of a historically energy inefficient structure. While many castles sported a dungeon, complete with torture devices, this version employs a basement equipped with the latest in home comfort and safety systems. When the castle's completed, we'll have a castle that has the best in old world styling and the most modern technologies. It'll be very kind in the environment. It'll use very little fuel, very little electricity. Since we use very little fuel, we have very little emissions. Everything is very clean. Everything is very comfortable. Comfort begins with keeping warm during Massachusetts' long winters. But you won't find heated air blowing through vents here. The castle is warmed by radiant heat. A boiler in the basement heats water, which is then circulated through tubing embedded in the floors of the castle. The heat radiates through the floors and into the home. During construction of the new American castle, workers routed more than 16,000 feet of half-inch tubing into the concrete floors on each level. There's a lot of concrete. We've got very good insulation in this building, and we're heating the objects and not directly the air. We want to modulate that water temperature, and we modulate it by having sensors outside that detect the air temperature and the warm water circulating through the floor. And through some programming, we can change that temperature to automatically increase or decrease as it gets warmer or colder outside. There is one high-efficiency heating technology, however, that taps energy from the same source that keeps basement temperatures stable. It's called the geothermal heat pump. Heat pumps operate on earth power. The earth absorbs and stores the sun's energy as heat. Underground temperatures remain within a narrow range year-round. Generally located in the basement, the geothermal heat pump taps this reliable energy source through a heat exchanger or a system of tubing buried outside the basement. With geothermal, with the constant temperature underground, you're able to use that by extracting heat from it using pipe, high-density polyethylene pipe that we put in the ground. You run water in it or a mixture of water and any freeze, and you're able to heat or cool your home. When surface area is limited, the tube can also be sunk in wells vertically below the home. Or to maximize ground space, the pipes can be coiled in a slinky pattern and buried. While heating and cooling is job number one, today the basement is also ventilating and purifying the air that we breathe. And ventilation's function really is to dilute the pollutants that are inside the occupied space. And the pollutants aren't necessarily bad things. It's moisture. It's the fact that we breathe. We put out carbon dioxide, and that needs to be diluted. We cook and create odors and smells in the house. We take showers and we create moisture. All of those things need to be reduced in their level to provide a good interior environment. The heat recovery ventilator, or HRV, is becoming a common basement appliance. It uses the heating and cooling ducts to exhaust the stale air and introduce the fresh air while maintaining a constant temperature in the home. The fresh air stream passes through a heat exchange unit made of multiple plates of aluminum or plastic. At the same time, the exhaust of stale indoor air passes through the fresh air path at an angle. Heat from the outgoing air is exchanged and passed back into the home with the fresh air. So it reduces the amount of heat that the space conditioning system has to add in the winter and reduces the amount of cooling that the space conditioning system has to add in the summer. Clean air is a nice touch, but some basements play a higher stakes game. For homeowners with too much to lose, there's a new high-tech sentry in the basement, the fire suppression system. Traditionally, sprinkler systems could cause excessive water damage. Now, clean agent gas systems are used in commercial spaces or labs to protect sensitive equipment from fire. In the basement of the new American castle, a mixture of drying nitrogen and liquid halocarbon is standing by, while a series of discharge nozzles are located throughout the home. When a fire breaks out, 
Two smoke detectors must verify the emergency before sending a signal to the basement control center. That signal of detection is then sent to the control panel. That control panel will then begin the operation of notifying devices, alarm devices, and even notifying your local fire department in order to complete that sequence of operation. Once the control panel um, sends an electric signal to this particular control head, which is going to be located on top of the cylinder and valve assembly, and this control head mechanically will release a pin at the top allowing pressure to come off the top of the piston and the contents of the agent or the contents of the cylinder being discharged throughout the pipe network and through the nozzles to total flood the space. Fighting Fires is simply the latest addition to the basement's long resume of faithful service. For certain homeowners, the basement is not only the most important room in the house, it is the house. Our most reliable protection from the elements has been below ground. We've been digging into Mother Earth not just to build our basements, but our very homes. If you look back, uh, people have always taken advantage of the heating and cooling benefits of the Earth and the fact that they didn't have other building materials. Some of history's most resourceful subterranean home builders were the buffalo hunters, who came to the treeless plains of West Texas in the 1870s. With few building materials available, they applied the basic concept of the basement and built dugout homes. Dugouts are pretty much a phenomenon of the plains. Other areas of Texas where you have timber, where you have um, uh, access to milled lumber, you're not gonna have dugouts. The typical dugout was carved into the side of a hill. In some cases, cottonwood was hauled great distances to complete the upper walls. The primary purpose of doing a dugout is, first of all, it saves you on building material. You're actually using the earth as part of your building material. And secondly, another good characteristic of a dugout is that it provides insulation against the elements. This is the north wall. And the north wall is half underground and half above ground. So what's happening is when you get those strong north winds in the wintertime, this is what's protecting you from, from the north winds. The, the, you, the fact that your structure is below grade. One century later, in the 1970s, Americans revived the dugout concept with a new version of the basement, the earth-sheltered home. The most common method of construction involves excavating one side of a low hill. Footings and a slab foundation are poured, followed by concrete walls. Earth surrounds three of the walls, and the roof is covered with a minimum of 12 inches of soil, enough to support a range of plant life. The south-facing wall and entryway are exposed to take advantage of solar energy. In the 70s, these subterranean homes gained a following among Americans concerned with rising energy costs. Earth-sheltered homes promised a large savings in heating and cooling bills because of their position below the Earth's grade. In warmer climates like Texas, the energy bills almost disappeared. Or just a few feet below the surface, the temperature of the soil varies only a couple of three degrees year round. So you're integrated with this large mass that tends to stabilize the temperature in the house. Building earth sheltered homes in Texas not only saved residents from high energy bills, but also protected them from the deadly tornadoes. Ranchland of Snyder, Texas. One sheltered earth home can probably survive anything Mother Nature cares to whip up. The Green Ranch Home is affectionately referred to by some as the bomb shelter. This home contains over 80 tons of internal steel building material, supporting 70 tons of dirt on the roof. A combined weight of 150 tons. The Earth Shelter design is a personal tribute to owner Jack Green's ancestors, who first settled the area in dugout homes. Some of my great grand people moved to this area uh, back in the 1800s. They settled at Green Springs and lived in a dugout. And they decided to go in the ground, kind of like ground squirrels, like where I guess some of them got the idea. 
because concrete walls often crack and draw moisture, Green decided to erect walls made from an unorthodox building material. Dog houses are heavy-duty steel sheds used by Texas oil rig workers as on-site locker rooms. Well, they were selling all this material off at a very low rate, uh, about 10 cents on the dollar. And when I looked at that, I thought, there's the material for an underground house. After excavating into the side of a hill, six of the dog houses were positioned side by side to create the foundation and walls for the 2,000 square foot home. The only wood in the house is the trim and the cabinets. There's not any wood other than the facings and the trim on the house. Everything else, even the studs in it are steel. It's held up, you might say, perfectly because there's never been a drop of water in it. This heavy-duty custom home may not be practical for the average homeowner. But with energy prices in constant doubt, the Earth sheltered home may be poised for a comeback. But for conventional U.S. homeowners, the traditional basement has offered an opportunity to maximize the value of their homes while fulfilling their dreams of comfort, good health, and good times. I really think there is more to it, especially ever since 9-11. There's really been a trend towards, you know, cocooning, nesting in the house. And so people are looking for for a sense of security, a sense of that, you know, that they have a space that their kids can come, they can play in the basement, and even as they get into their teenage years, that it's something where they know that it's gonna be the most popular spot for all the teens to come and hang out so that they know where their kids are. As the forces of man and nature drive people back into the ground, the basement is shedding its distasteful image. Clean air, lots of toys, and plenty of elbow room. The high life awaits in the basement. <laughs>